Welcome back. We want to welcome back Coach Kyle. Welcome back. Um, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that, was <laughs> that was amazing. All right, so part one was just to learn about you. Part two is going to actually test to see if you know what you're talking about or not we'll see so we'll see if you actually do know what you're talking about i personally don't so i'm gonna let you pretty much say the answers and then i'm just gonna repeat them so that way i can use it for my own content yeah just yeah. kidding copyright <laughs> copyright copyright awesome so um we reached out to our group in the our our, our facebook group for our members just to get an idea on some questions that they might have. There were some people who reached out to me uh, privately, not privately, but through DMs to ask you some questions too. So we got about nine questions we're going to run through. Um, and yeah, so super broad, but what are your best recovery tactics for CrossFit? And I guess you can use CrossFit Loveland, other CrossFit gyms you've been to sort mm -hmm. of as your sample. So what would you say is some of the best recovery yeah, my, my personal favorites, uh, I really like foam rolling afterwards. Uh, just a really good way to beat up soft tissue. Uh, I also really enjoy some light cardio. So whether it's, we're, we're really good at here going for a walk, getting on the bike, just doing a nice cool down for, you know, two to five minutes at a low intensity, getting on a rower, same thing. Uh, you can even do some static stretching, which there's some research has shown that static stretching isn't really super beneficial, but in terms of a cool down and just like I said, mobilizing certain joints and just getting some soft tissue to loosen up, I think is the best way to go. Awesome. awesome. Uh, what I tell a lot of my patients is just do something. Just do something. Don't crush yourself in a workout and be like, all right, I'm going to go sit <laughs> time, at my desk for eight hours. Time, time to go like, just, just do something. Dude. Um side note story so so there was the last open workout that was thrusters and front squats and all that stuff right? yeah yeah it's brutal brutal the next day so i didn't recover literally just went home and ate because the next day we drove to moab <laughs> yeah see that'll do it oh, my legs hurt so yeah, bad dude, dude. you and, feel like the tin man oh dude around. and and the airbnb had upstairs downstairs and i it was the worst. It was so hard. So anyway, recover. Yeah. Um, do something. Do something. Do something. Um, yeah, and I think it's also just a good time, just like you said, to to stretch out kind of whatever gets tight mm -hmm. afterwards too, right? So like for me, deadlifts, if I do high repetition deadlifts, sometimes my low back will tighten up. Yeah. It doesn't hurt after, you know, a half hour or so, but um, just kind of good to, to loosen up those joints that tend to stiffen up, yeah? I agree. Yeah, especially on the backside or pecs. Pecs also tighten up pretty quick. Awesome. Uh so if you have scar tissue built up from a previous injury, what methods do you recommend to do daily or before your workouts? So I'm guessing with this question, they're having some sort of mobility issue. Um, so the first thing, it depends. The first thing I would want to know, is it really the scar tissue that's limiting whatever joint it is? Like let's say, for instance, the ankle. Uh, is it really the scar tissue from some sort of scope or injury you had there? Or is it more the actual ankle joint? Um, so it would depend on the approach. If it's actual the ankle joint, you'd want to do some band immobilizations, different things like that. If it's true scar tissue adhesion, uh, you're going to want to beat that up with some sort of instrument. Could be, you know, the non-sharp end of a butter knife, not the actual blade, the non-sharp end. Uh, put some lotion on there, beat it up. Uh, when it's a true actual adhesed piece of scar, uh, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to hurt. I'm usually very upfront with my patients. Like this is not going to be fun. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time too. Okay. Um, I'm not saying I know who asked this question, but let's just pretend I do know who asked yeah, this question. Yeah, and let's pretend sure. I do know that it was this individual's knees mm -hmm. that in the bottom of a squat was causing some discomfort, mm -hmm. reached out to, um, I don't know if they reached out to you, but I know they have a, a, a chiropractor um, from back home, and mm -hmm. that's what they had mentioned, that it was some mm -hmm. scar tissue. So Where's the scar tissue at? Um, they said right above the knee, mm -hmm. right above sort of this knee, mm -hmm. knee pocket area. Yeah, so once again, I mean, we'd want to really differentially find out is it actual scar tissue or is it more patellofemoral issues? Uh, is it a tracking problem with the kneecap? Uh, Cause usually that can be caused by imbalance between ankle and hip mobility, some weakness within the hip. Uh, it would just depend. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and for those who don't know, how does scar tissue build up? Yeah, so we have an injury, and what the body's going to want to do, it's going to want to heal that. So it's going to send a whole lot of blood, cells, 
fluid to go repair that tissue. All right, that's the acute phase. Then after all that calms down, your body is going to start putting more tissue back in the area, specifically collagen. Collagen is what makes up the outside layer of the muscle called fascia. Uh, it's sticky, it's thick, and sometimes the body's just really good at doing what it's supposed to do in order to repair an injury. So it just puts a lot down there. Gotcha. Only problem is when there's a lot of it, it doesn't move well. It doesn't slide as it's supposed to. So it can adhere down and restrict some motion. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and then, so let's... Yeah, we'll just move on. Um, what is the, and this is always kind of fascinating, what is the, the connection between tight hamstrings, tight glutes, or we'll say inactive glutes and low back pain? get this a lot. Yeah. Um, it depends. So hip mobility is key in terms of a healthy low back. Um, so if your hips are indeed tight, specifically the question I believe asked the hamstrings, uh, it could potentially put your back in a, a poor position. So the hamstrings, they come up from the back of the knee, they attach to the pelvis. All right. So let's say the hamstrings are really tight and really short. It's going to pull that pelvis down into more flex forward position. Now let's say that person has a flexion intolerance in terms of their back. If their hamstrings are really tight, it's just going to put them in more of a flex position. All right. Specifically, let's say going down to a squat. Going down to a squat, we need hip flexion. We need the hips to bend. All right. What this hamstrings do, they extend. They do the exact opposite. So you don't have mobility there. Well, something's got to move in order for you to go down. What's going to move? It's going to be your low back, your pelvis, dumping you forward into a position that you may not like. Like I said, it's never usually the hamstrings that is the problem. People with low back pain may have issues with their hamstrings, but it's usually something else. And with low back pain, it could be a multitude of different things. Uh, but like I said, just global hip mobility is huge for low back health. So yeah, you want your hamstrings to be mobile, ideally, you know, 70, 80 degrees of motion in terms of your straight leg raise. Uh, but it's not the end all be all. It's not like you have tight hamstrings, have fun with your low back pain. Yep. yep. Well, there's so much that connects to the low back too, dude. It It is. I mean, it's, it's what I call the abdominal pillar. Um, so it's the stable base from which our arms and legs move from. Um, so just because you have low back pain, it could be some of the areas above some of the areas below, or it could be a true low back issue. So it's, I hate to use this answer all the time. It just, it depends. Sure. Yeah, totally. Uh, but to get back to that previous point with the glutes, glutamate amnesia is a real thing. So once those glutes start to shut off, either with chronic hip pain, with chronic low back pain, um, your, your low back's not going to be very stable. So the glutes attach to the low back and they provide stability as well as move our hip rotationally side to side and forward backward. So if we lose the ability to contract our glutes, We're going to ask our low back and our knees to do way more than they need to, which can lead to breakdown over time. Sure. So (laughs) my patients can attest to it. I'm all about glute strength, man. Glute max, the little glutes on the side, it it is huge, especially if you want to do some of the dynamic movements here in CrossFit. So big time. Yeah. Um, Well, and there's so much, I don't think a lot of people understand how much knee pain is contributed to potential glutes, hamstrings, mainly glutes as well. Hamstrings too. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. And uh, I like butt stuff. I think butt stuff goes a long way as far as just not not only activating, but just building, you know, Mm -hmm. just building overall strength for um, just for resilient low back. Knees, Agreed. Hips, um, obviously. Hips, yeah. Definitely hips too. And like you said, especially something in here where a lot of the movements are dynamic, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like squats, we're doing tempo squats, but that's pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're doing air squats, you're going at a pretty quick pace. You're doing multiple reps over and over. And so if you mm-hmm. don't have that foundation or base built up, you're going to lead to breakdown. Agreed. In terms of the lower body, what are your three most functional movements? You have the hinge, you have the squat, and you have the lunge. Yep. They all involve hip extension. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest hip extender? Glute max, yep. as well as hamstrings, but mainly glute max. Yep. And in terms of the little glutes on the side, the medius and minimus, they're what dictates whether your knee's crashing in, whether your knee's crashing out, or whether your knees are right in line where they should be. Sure. Well, and even how the, the glute meat ties into the IT band as well, mm-hmm. and for runners who have IT band issues, check the glutes, right? Good. Yeah, for sure. So um, proper bracing in the core for a strong position on, count, on compound lifts. Um, there's mixed cueing 
right? Uh, that, that come with sort of bracing, let's just say, for the deadlift. You know, some people like to push out. Some people like to push down. Mm-hmm. What is your preference and or what is your thoughts? Or can you sort of just give some background into the two types of cueing or multiple cueing and what seems to work the best? Because even when you say, you know, like suck down, like I'm going to punch you. A lot of people just flex here. Yeah, they post really post. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, what what do you feel? Let's actually say this. What do you feel is the most effective cueing in brace for, to get the results that you're wanting in terms of abdominal bracing yes it's it's crucial so yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's just throw that out there in terms of cueing uh, i mean it depends on what's going on is it someone that's just extended all the time i usually tell them just to pull the ribs down um the cue i'll use i'll, I'll take my pinky and i'll take my thumb i'll put pinky at belly button i'll put thumb right at ribs and i'll say i want you to squeeze as hard as you can keep this position the whole time uh, how I learned it personally, uh, you know, I just, you know, like someone was going to come by and kick me in the stomach, you know, just bracing really hard. Like you said, not necessarily bringing Crunching. down into flexion, uh, but just squeezing as hard as I could until I got the coordination. Cause that's a tough part is it actually takes a lot of skill to be able to brace your core and breathe at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Well, and it's easy for us. Yeah. It's because we have a lot of practice with mm-hmm. it. Well, and I, I feel like there's even as people are like, because there was one point where I was saying, pretend like you're taking a poop. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But you're sort of pushing down. Mm-hmm. And I briefly read about how that could potentially cause pelvic floor issues. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I think it can, it should be simple. Well, let me let me punch you in the gut, right? Brace. Um, but that was kind of like, I think that's kind of how the question was phrased. Like how how are you taking or even like take the air from here? push it down to your gut type mm-hmm. thing i'll even take a band sometimes and just put them into a ball press i'll have them just hold their arms out here be like do not move your trunk mm-hmm. and then i'll poke around as like, you see you feel what's going on right here in your stomach that's what should happen when you ascend a descend from a squat nice, yeah, nice. just different things like that because if verbal cueing is not working you can always try tactile cueing or just proving it to them with like, a different movement sure um so cool so i'm gonna throw in my own question what do you think about belts overall <laughs> weightlifting belts yeah, i know i know yeah. uh i mean you know they're so the purpose of the belt is really it's just a tactile cue to brace everything around your core uh but what it's not meant to do it's not meant to provide all of the stability around your abdominal pillar while you move uh that's why you know me personally and what i recommend with people here is really don't put the belt on until you get to that max weight where you're actually breaking more at the midsection because the more you use the belt the less you're teaching yourself and allowing yourself to naturally brace and you don't want to be the guy that wears the belt just to do bicep curls i mean because you're just going to decondition everything around here if you're just using that passive stability of the belt to you know brace your abdominals sure you know like we're deadlifting yesterday like i eventually put the belt on just because it was super heavy weight but uh, there's time and a place it's definitely not an every lift thing big time yeah. big time i won't get into lifters anyway um cool so when do you feel when do you feel it's okay to work through a, a tweaked feeling or an odd feeling in mm-hmm. the shoulder back knee ankle whatever um versus when you should say no mm-hmm. I know that might be a hard question to sort of unpack, but, you know, is there is there a scale that you use? Is there just like common sense? Like, does it hurt? Then stop. Um, what are your thoughts? So movement's medicine. I, I never tell any of my patients, you need to just stop moving. Uh, what the big conversation I always have, especially in the initial, in initial examination, is you need to stop doing aggravating activities. So if it's getting worse, if you have front side shoulder pain, it just continues to get worse. The more pull-ups you do, that's something you need to modify. Mm-hmm. You don't need to stop completely. You can do something else, whether it's, you know, feels better on ring rows or potentially just pulling from a bar is just not something you do right now. You can modify it to do something and still gain strength and mobility in other areas while that area heals. Uh, but I'd say the good rule of thumb is, is it getting worse? Stop. Okay. Okay. If, there's, if there's no change, continue would you say, or even then? Good. I'm glad you asked that. If it doesn't get better, like I'm sure you felt it, like even, you know, myself moving through some of these movements, it's like, yeah, that kind of bugs my shoulder. But then, you know, I put my shoulder in a different position or a few more reps go by. I'm like, all right, yeah, no, I'm good. Uh, but yeah, if it's getting worse or staying about the same, 
I would do something different. Cool. Well, I think, you know, for, for myself or for us, uh, we always like to say, how long has it been an issue? Because mm-hmm. if it just happened yesterday or two days ago or three days ago, the body's still healing itself, mm-hmm. right? That's It's kind of hard to say, like, unless your arm is literally dangling. And I'm like, oh, it's fine. It's going to fix itself. Yeah. Um, you know, you need a little bit more time, right, to kind of get a good idea if it's really aggravating mm-hmm. you or if it's just something that just happened you know, quicker in the moment than it heals itself. And that's the acute stage of healing. I mean, you have to let that inflammatory phase run its course and then you get more of the repair remodeling phases as you go forward. But yeah, if you just get stuck in that inflammatory phase because you keep upsetting the same tissue over and over again, the thing's not going to heal. Yep. That's usually the, the toughest thing for most people. There was, yeah, there was there was a, a, an individual who took a couple weeks off who had some, some mm. shoulder pain. They took yeah, some, yeah, a couple sounds, weeks off. Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. And then they felt better. It was felt, it was yeah. Yeah, so it felt weird. a lot better. And then what was what made me happy is they came back and they're like, "I'm gonna take it easy." And I was like, yeah. and "He started doing his his shoulder program, Dude. and he said the shoulder program felt good." I was like, "Wow, who knew? <laughs> who who would have thunk? Who would have thunk?" Um, awesome. I loved this question. Um, is it normal for your knees to crack when you squat? Depends. <laughs> Depends on. What kind of cracking? Clicks and pops? Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. All what, good. What would you, how would you explain why that happens? So when you get those clicks and pops, what it really is, is you get this gapping of the joint, uh, which creates this little bubble to form uh, from the synovial fluid within the joint. And that bubble eventually goes up and pops. So it could be that gas bubble. It could be a little glicking grinding of the joint together, or maybe some scar tissue within there. Uh, but it's not pathological. The only time it is, is if it starts getting worse mm-hmm. and it starts to get painful, it starts to swell, then you're going to want to get that looked at. Sure. Yeah. And and sometimes, in, and I don't know if they're referring to this as well, but sometimes to, well, I guess when the shoulder's out of position or when it's not moving like it should, you can sometimes feel like those like those snags or like those pops as well. Oh, especially in the shoulder. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, um, just because there's so much stuff crossing over the, the shoulder joint in general. So And the shoulder moves a lot. I mean, it's a golf ball and a golf tee. So it moves around quite a bit. And as it starts to move around, it may bump into things. It may cause those gas bubbles to come out. Um, you know, it's, it's going to pop. It just happens. But like I said, as long as it's not getting worse and there's not a lot of swelling around it, you're good. As long as it doesn't echo in the gym, you're good. Yeah. I, Even I sometimes it echoes. Like my ankle, like I said, I had ankle injuries. My yeah. ankle gives some loud pops when yeah. I'm, especially in the morning when I'm warming up. Um, I say it's not a big deal. There's a there's a couple times when I had some newer people come in here and I'd like drop down to a squat or something. They'd hear a pop. they <laughs> like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that actually felt really <laughs> that good. That actually felt good. <laughs> I actually feel better now. Um all right, so you kind of answered this question, but we'll kind of go over it uh, again. So if I get hurt, do I stop working out or do I scale back? It depends on how hurt you are, you know. Um, are you able to still do other things? Right? Let's say the shoulder, for instance. You know, let's say it's very uncomfortable to go overhead. Uh, are you able to pull? Are you able to push? Are you able to at least stabilize in an isometric position? Uh, are there things that you can do Instead of pressing overhead for now to see if it heals, you know, I think that's a good way to go. Um, man, I, I even forgot how the question was phrased. Um, or do you stop moving? How? <laughs> Movement's medicine, dude. Yeah, a- absolutely not. Um, sometimes, like I said, you have to let that inflammatory phase run its course, uh, but you should still be moving in the meantime. Mm-hmm. If it's an upper body injury, work the crap out of your lower body. Yep. Lower body injury, work the upper. Well, we had a member who broke her foot during the open about two or three years ago. She got so good at single leg squatting. Yeah. So good because she was squatting on one leg. Upper body's probably jacked, too. Yeah, just yeah. super jacked. Yeah. Super jacked. Um, all right. We kind of talked about this, but maybe we can dive a little bit more into it. Is CrossFit as dangerous as most people believe? Absolutely not. Uh, as a PT, I see bodybuilders quite often, and you know they're just going to Vossa or 24. Uh, my argument, because I, I hear a lot of people say, "Oh, you're a PT. Oh, you do CrossFit. Isn't that you know counterintuitive?" I said, "No, actually, it's not. Because what's nice is that you actually get." instructive feedback every class you know like you you don't get that when you're just going unless you're paying for one-on-one personal training you don't just get that when you're going to you know level athletic club or things like that um 
so at least you have that, you know, and then my opinion is that CrossFit's all encompassing. I mean, we have a lot of varied movements that, you know, hit us in daily activities of life. You know, we work on all energy systems. Uh, so in my opinion, no, I, I, I think it's, less dangerous i know we're doing a lot more ballistic movements uh, but i think it's less dangerous than potentially going into your your, your bodybuilding gym and it always it always depends on the coaching true very true so then you know in that same in that same breath i guess like what are your thoughts on working in a fatigued state depends on As, what you're doing i mean yeah uh, i mean you don't, especially with, during the Metcon, I mean, you don't want your form to just go to absolute garbage. I mean, you can work in a fatigue state while still not being unsafe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you work in a fatigue state, but it just depends on what your movement looks like. Big time. Because I think that's the one of the biggest arguments, right, is like people are doing complex movements like muscle ups and snatches, snatches you know, in, in a fatigue state, you know. What's your weight at? Exactly. You know? Exactly. What's what, your load at? Yeah. What's, what what's can you volume? handle? Yeah. 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 And that's that's why I think it's people don't understand. But uh, And obviously, they, if they're not in here, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably the biggest question in their argument. And it's, and it's a hard argument to make. It's like, yeah, but, I mean, you remember back in your sports days when you wanted to vomit, mm -hmm. but you still had to run 10 more sprints. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or like for wrestling where – we were doing three man rolls and we had to do that 10 more times while doing one minute live takedowns in between. Yeah. We were in a fatigue state for sure. Agreed. And probably in a lot more compromising positions. It's just, I think, I think the hardest part is that we're trying to, we're trying to make our lives better and people see it as, okay, well you're doing things that are making it dangerous. Yeah. I, I see that, but at the same time, I mean, it really comes down to coaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what does the movement look like? You know, can you scale back the movement to where they're still exercising, but it's a lot safer position? Because, um, I mean, you know, you can tell when people are putting themselves in harm's way. Uh, but if you don't correct that, like, you know, that that's that's on the coach, you yep. know? I mean, the a person thinks they're doing it correctly. The person thinks that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but if it's too much load, too much volume, the movement's not right, it needs to be scaled in a different manner that makes Big it time. safe. Big time. I agree. What is one exercise that you feel is overrated? And and I, I don't know if they were referring to a prehab. Let's do this. Let's just pretend. Hit me with it. Let's yeah. just pretend. Let's just pretend we know what they're talking about. Um, let's say, what is one prehab exercise that you feel is overrated? Dude, I hate the Jefferson curl. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, if you guys don't know what the Jefferson curl is, uh, Manny, why don't you go ahead and yeah. give, give us an example? And, and what what's the Jefferson curl typically prescribed for? Um, low back tightness, um, hamstring tightness. Um, all I really yeah I know it's yeah. it it's usually for for upper back mobility um which in terms of the human anatomy a lot of us sit a lot of us do desk work or you know read sit in the car so we're typically in this flex posture so not a whole lot of people walk around like this in this extended position so in order to so my argument is, why are you doing that exercise? Do you really need thoracic flexion? Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people do, they typically do it with weight, yeah. right? Um, so what you're doing in that position, you're really loading the low back and you're putting a lot of stress on the posterior um, you know, neural tissue within the back, mm -hmm. which just leads for a recipe for dis disaster, especially for a movement that a person probably doesn't really even need, sure. you know, there's other ways to do, you know, thoracic flexion or lumbar flexion. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I can't stand that movement. I, I know what people think the benefit is, but does that patient really need that? Or does sure. that person really need that? Sure. Is it the best way to go about it? Should it be loaded? Probably not. Well, and, and I think, and I remember when I first, when you and I first started chatting, you know, I came to you when I was diving more into um, trying to help people get out of pain, right? Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to use my expertise to help my members. And that mm -hmm. was, I think that was even before you were a coach. Yeah. Like I was trying to bridge that gap. Like we talked about, mm -hmm. My understanding was always like with tight hamstrings or if if there is limited range of motion in, say, a toe touch stretch, mm -hmm. 
taking those hamstrings through a range of motion weighted allows more change that's like that's mobility technically right mm-hmm. where flexibility is just how long can the how long can the muscle stretch right um what do you need your hamstrings to be completely elongated well that's like when yeah when that's the thing need that is i didn't understand you could do that with an rdl yeah you know what i mean and or you can do it yeah i would say functionally with hip hinge mm-hmm. you know but you can keep the low back in a very steady yep. functional place because yep, yep, yep. like ideally the low back doesn't go into end range flexion when you're under load and when you're moving around in the gym well, it depends. There's some people that there's some people that move like <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing not, deadlift it workouts. It's not <laughs> ideal, and with a lot of movements here, I mean, it's you don't want the low back to sure. move. It should be stable. Sure, exactly. Especially yeah. loaded into flexion. I, I I didn't know that the Jefferson curl was your was your most overrated exercise. Dude, I, I wouldn't have even I actually asked. can't stand it. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have asked you at that point. Yeah. In time. Um, all right, so now let's change gears. Let's go into Let's just call it a strength exercise or a conditioning exercise that you feel is overrated. Overrated because, like, I personally don't like it, or overrated because, um, like, Th- it's unsafe or doesn't do. It's not efficient. Like, what would? Let's just say there's a better way to do it. Just like the Jefferson curl. Man, I mean, squat snatches got it, dude. That's I mean, yeah, got. the only thing I actually like squat snatches, um, you know, with a snatch, it's like, you know, <laughs> people always talk about like functional movement patterns is like, is a snatch really functional? Yep. A bicep is, curl, is, is, bicep uh, curl's more functional. I know. <laughs> is, is an overhead squat really functional? Yeah. Like when do we move, move like that yeah. in actual life? Uh, but I mean, I like both those two moments. Yeah. Um, dude, I don't really have like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, there was one. That we had for a warm up, and it was mountain climbers. Okay, and you were like, "I don't see the benefit." That's of <laughs> that's to me. That's like a prehab exercise. Sure. That's not a strength exercise. Sure. Yeah, I I I'll still stand on that. I don't think like doing multiple mountain climbers in a row really does anything yeah. for you. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah. So, is there a strength or no? Mountain climbers. Okay. <laughs> I think mountain climbers are mountain climbers aren't bad. To use them as an ab exercise, no, no, there's no, no way. There's, there's, there's no, no way. way. No, no way. What, I mean, to use them to, I mean, you know, get you breathing heavy and get some blood flowing to the body. Yeah, I can see that. Yep, yep. And I think that's the only reason. Yeah, there's yeah. Uh, there's a lot better ab. Load up a heavy barbell and do a deadlift. Yeah, best ab exercise ever. Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, all right, I'll, I'll throw this one at throw you. This one, this yeah. t- like a very heavy weighted Russian twist. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I hate Russian twists yeah. too in general. Like I'm all about like moving in you know the rotational plane, but just to like get this heavy kettlebell and just throw it side to side once again in a more flexed position. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I would do something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. It's just uh, the risk versus reward isn't really there. Well, I think that's the biggest thing, and and you could probably agree with me here is there's really no wrong exercise. Agreed. Right? It's all in its application. Yeah. So um, so I can even say like. I personally don't feel a squat snatch is very necessary, mm-hmm. but if you're training to be a competitive athlete, mm-hmm. if you're training to be an Olympic weightlifter, mm-hmm. it's a skill you need to possess yeah. and, you, and it needs to be really heavy mm-hmm. and you need to be able to continually do it with good technique. Yeah. Right. Or um, if that's something you just like to do. Exactly. If it's a yeah, skill you want to try, totally, yeah. Yeah. totally agree. Um, awesome. Last question I have for you. Do you like massage guns? Yeah, but they're not the <laughs> fix all like problem solver. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, really what it is, is, I mean, it's, it's a more convenient form of foam rolling. Um, so the research has come out on percussive therapy. Isn't great. Yeah. You know? Uh, so it depends on what you use it for. Like I said, I like foam rolling, uh, you know, but, percussive therapy i mean it's really just the same thing it's just some people some people think like that like if they have knee pain just hammering wherever their knee pain is or it's, that's, bog- it's bogging out yeah right? that's gonna fix it it's like oh my god this actually really hurts it's like yeah it's not doing anything either <laughs> uh so I, I i like it i'd say the one place i think it's the best is the glutes like lateral okay. glutes just get in there and those suckers can be sure. tight at times so sure. um yeah, I, I like it for what it's worth, but it's not a, it's not going to fix all your problems. Awesome. Um, and I actually got one more question. This just stemmed from when we were talking. What are what are some of your favorite techniques to use in your practice? Um, 
and what do you like about them? And it doesn't have to be long. You can just kind of techniques for like uh, manual therapy, manual like therapy. The I, I know you have the the uh, needles. Yeah, so I do a lot of dry needling, uh, spinal manipulation. Uh, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, which is a fancy word of saying just beating up soft tissue with different instruments. Um, what else? I, I do dry cupping with movements. Uh, those are probably the, the big four that I do. I'll also do some uh, banded or belted joint mobilizations, just depends on what's going on. Sure. Uh, and then, yeah, strength and conditioning and corrective exercises. Absolutely. I love it. Do you have anything else you want to add? What do you have against lifters? <sighs> when. That is your when you can only squat with your lifters, mm-hmm. when you deadlift with your lifters. Oof, when you, don't do that. When you literally use like you're like, oh, we're squatting. Let me put my lifters on. Air squats today. Air squats today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I'm not gonna lie, like you know, for open workouts, it's performance, right? Mm-hmm. It's I'm not trying to move the best. I'm like, how can I get myself the furthest in this workout? Mm-hmm. So like. Two years ago, whenever we did, it was the clean and jerks and pistols mm-hmm. and box box step ups or jumps yeah, yeah. workout. Um, I put my lifters on because I hadn't been working out. Mm-hmm. My ankle mobility was garbage, yeah. and I could not get a full pistol in normal shoes. But mm-hmm. yeah, when when lifters become a crutch, and yeah. that's the only way you can squat, or that's yeah. the only way you could do air squats. Yeah. You know, that's the, that's I agree. the only thing I got. I agree. And I mean, quite honestly, too, like my all time best clean and jerk was done in nanos. Okay. And it matched the same as lifter. So I was like, yeah. well, I guess I don't need it. However, though, snatching is a totally different ball. Snatch, game same thing like clean jerk. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Like cleans, like I feel my, my front squat's pretty healthy, but my overhead squat's garbage. So mm-hmm. like any help I can get. So yeah. I'm just saying if that's your crutch. Agreed. Oh, it's like, like it's like the just like the, the Theragun. Yeah. You know, like the yeah. Theragun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So or the belt. Yeah. As of now, if you have a Theragun, lifters, and a weight belt and use that every day. And you think that's going to solve your problems? Yeah, it's come not, talk to it's me. It's not come talk to Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, cool. Well, thanks for doing this, dude. Appreciate this. Yeah, thank you. Super man. helpful, super insightful, and I just love um, how you're trying to help our members out too, man. I dude, mean, I love being part of the team. So yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Until next time. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>